Hey everyone, welcome back to the Full Armor of God podcast. I'm your host, Don Purdom. So, I'm going to start recording messages now in the podcast that are relating to the Bible studies that we're doing every Tuesday evening as we think about a year from now possibly planting an Orthodox church in the northwestern Lancaster area, which would include Dauphin County, Harrisburg, Hummelstown, you know, etc. Anyway, you get the whole point. Don't need to get into all of that. So today I want to talk about what is salvation and why is it important. But to do that, what we have to really do is chronicle what is sin. And I'm going to guarantee you that sin is not what you think it is. And let's get into it. Let's talk about why. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, we have the account of the fall as Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of good and, uh, good and evil or the tree of life. And what does Adam and Eve do? They disobey God and they listen to the temptations of the serpent, which in the Old Testament, the ser- serpent is often a symbol for Satan. And so he kind of tricks them. He asks them the same questions he asks us, you know, surely God won't let you die. Surely God isn't going to punish you if you do what he told you not to do. You know, he, he plants these ideas in their mind, which he plants in ours, quite frankly, as well. And what do we get? The result is Adam and Eve are removed from the Garden of Eden. And then we have sin through Adam and Eve as they now give birth to new children and new children's sin and on and on down the line it goes. And here we are today. So with that said, we have to talk about what is sin and why is this so important to God? Well, let's think for just a second about God's character. The Bible tells us over and over that God is holy and to be holy is to be without sin. Right? And righteousness comes out of holiness. It's the behavior. It's what we do, or it's what God does as a result of his holiness. See, his acts are without sin. That's that's righteousness. So in its most basic meaning, you know, most evangelical teaching around sin simply means to be without holiness or righteousness. We have the whole imagery of Romans three twenty of Romans three twenty three, right? We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And we're reminded over and over again that sin is an offense against God. But what does that mean? Isn't there more to sin than this? Well, actually there is. And so in the Old Testament, we have a number of Hebrew words that specifically talk about different types of sin. And these are really important to understand in the Old Testament, because before we can really understand what Jesus did on the cross and what the forgiveness of sin is that Jesus did and how that picture is so much different than what we see prior to Jesus in the Old Testament and how God interacted with the saints in the Old Testament, we have to understand their worldview around sin. How did God define sin? Because the definitions don't change. And that has profound impact when we look later on in Jesus' words and we look at the Apostle Paul's words and Peter and John and etc., right? So let's talk about what are the words for sin? There are like seven seven crucial words that, that we have to understand. And these are going to play out now throughout the rest of the Old Testament over the next number of weeks. Today we're going to look at Numbers chapter... 15, and we're going to then look at King David in 2 Samuel 11 and Psalm 51 to see how these words play out. So, the first word in here is hata. Its meaning is erring, doing wrong, missing the mark, going astray, and it's probably one of the more common words for sin in the Old Testament. The next word is pasa. Now, I'm, I may not, not being Jewish and not being Hebrew and, and not always knowing the pronunciation of these words, if any of you out there know what that is, and I'm butchering them, please forgive me. 
they didn't really teach us pronunciation in seminary when I was at Dallas Theological Seminary on some of these words. But anyway, Pesa, willful rebellion against God or people. It refers to an act or a break with God. Sarah, a departure from a path or a stubborn deviation. Ma'al, treachery or unfaithfulness. To eba, abomination, meaning repulsive or a bore. Arar, a curse or formal declaration of punishment. So think of words like in the Old Testament, you'll see the translation of this word as mischief, trouble, wrong, error, fraud, crime. You know, these are the kind of meanings of, of arar. And then awan. This is the word inequity. It's a perversity or depravity, guilt. It can be even a generational guilt. And it's the most frequent word for sin in the Old Testament. So this word is usually translated directly as inequity in the Old Testament. Pasa is generally the word for transgression, and we're going to see this later. right? And I'll re- restate the definitions of these words as we look at them in the Scripture. So, if we think about it, though, what is the ultimate consequence of sin? In most of our American presentation of the gospel, what we hear is that, do you want to go to hell? That's the question that's asked, right? Do you want to go to hell? And if you don't want to go to hell, then you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There really isn't a lot about, well, why are you going to hell? What have you done that violates the holiness of God so much that he can't be in your presence that creates a separation between you and him? Because, see, if holiness equals good, then sin equals evil. It's really that simple, but yet it's so much more than that, as we've already read just in the words. So, If sin separates us from God, then salvation is God's restorative plan. But it's not so simple in one regard. See, again, in the in the basic tradition of American uh, presentation of the gospel, think of Billy Graham, right? Billy Graham, many of us over the age of 30 have heard of Billy Graham. And the basic gospel presentation of most churches today is that it's a legalistic system. So you sinned, and that sin causes a punishment. There must be a justice or a penalty for your sin. It's a very rational way of thinking. But there's a missing piece in that. And the missing piece in the salvation story is that God is also relational. And the process of salvation is relational. And God's judgment is relational, right? So let's not just think about this in terms of sin and punishment, but let's also look at this in the context of love and grace or anger and consequence, because those are relational emotions, and God exhibits those as well. So we're going to start looking at What is this plan of salvation as it unveils itself in the Old Testament? And to do that, let's start in Numbers chapter 15, beginning in verse 30. Now, what I want you to realize is what's going on here. In in Numbers 15, we have had a whole situation arise out of the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus in particular Exodus, right? Moses was called by God to go to Pharaoh. I'm not going to get into the whole story. Maybe another day we'll do a more in-depth study on Moses. But Moses goes to Pharaoh and tells him three times to release my people, and Pharaoh says no, and all three times there is some type of a plague or a consequence that God reaps upon Pharaoh to make the point that I am the one true God, and you should release my people who are in your captivity. They're your slaves. They are grossly mistreated. And on the third and final one, Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go, or there's going to be a really bad consequence tonight. And again, Pharaoh ignores them, so Moses tells the Israelites, and some 
Egyptians even follow. They believe. And they put the blood around the door, around the door frames. And when the Holy Spirit comes over the city, if he sees that, he will protect the people But if he that are, that are dwelling in the homes. But if he doesn't see that, he will enter and he will take the firstborn child. And of course, Pharaoh doesn't do this, and Pharaoh's firstborn child is killed. And in his, in his pain and his agony, he finally relents and lets the people go. And so Moses takes them out. And as he gets to a certain point, Pharaoh comes back in his anger and resentment and says, oh, no, we're going to go get them suckers. Go get them. They must be punished for what has happened. And God, at this moment where they're trapped at the Red Sea, parts the Red Sea. The Israelites enter through it. The Egyptians chase them. When the Israelites get to the other side, God closes it back up, and they're all washed away. All of the Egyptians are washed away. The Israelites are protected. The Hebrews are protected. And now they're wandering in the desert. And things aren't going so well in the desert for them. They begin to grumble. They begin to say to Moses things like, "If we would have been better off in captivity than out here. And isn't that just true of us as human beings? Again, there is actual sin happening here. And when we go back and we look at those words we did earlier, and to realize that what this sin is is an offense against God. It's offense to, wouldn't it be kind of an offense that if you think about it, that, that God does this incredible thing, you witness the plagues, you witness Pharaoh's, you witness the Holy Spirit, and you witness the Red Sea, and you're out here grumbling? Well, this is where we find ourselves in Numbers 15. And in Numbers 15, Deuteronomy and Numbers are part of Torah. These are the laws of God. These are how they are to behave. And so in the first, the first 29 paragraph or, or verses of Numbers 15, it repeatedly th- says, like, for the unintentional sin, you shall. For the unintentional sin, you shall. In other words, these were sins that were committed that weren't purposely done. But verse 30, listen to this. This is the law. This is Torah. This is what people lived under before Jesus' redemptive act on the cross, burial, and resurrection. All three of those things are important. See, it's not just the cross. It's also the death and the resurrection. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So verse 30, but the person who does anything defiantly, you knew what you were doing, you thought about what you were doing, you knew it was wrong, and you chose to do it anyway. That's what this word defiant means here. The person who does anything defiantly, whether he is a native Hebrew or he has come from outside of the Hebrew community and has joined the Hebrew community, they're aliens, right? The person who does anything defiantly, whether he is a native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Think about that for a second. You are blaspheming the Lord if you knew. What you were doing was wrong, and you chose to do it anyway. You are making a mockery of God is what this means. Verse 31, because this person has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be cut off, his guilt shall be upon him. See, he's going to be that person who premeditatively sins. The word here is pasa, willful rebellion against God or people. You chose to break with God. You'll be removed from the people, you'll be cut off from them, and you'll be cut off from the land. There is no forgiveness, is what this passage means. In Torah, there is no forgiveness for those who blatantly and willfully choose to rebel against God. Now, we're going to see this next week when we start looking at 
the division of the northern and the southern kingdom and the 70-year captivity of the Jewish people. Daniel happens to be living at this time, right? We're going to see this over and over again and what God requires. So there is no sacrifice. See, all of these other verses in Numbers 15 tell for the unintentional sin, you shall offer up this sacrifice and you'll do this thing, right? So that you can maintain a relationship with Elohim, with God. Elohim is a one of the many Jewish words for God, most used word. So there's this relationship. Now this relationship is severed if you do these things. So how important is this? Let's look at an example of this type of sin. Is this beginning to make sense of, of how God saved people in the Old Testament? He saved them and allowed them to have relationship with them through unintentional sin. But if you knew what you were doing was wrong, it broke the relationship irreparably. But is this always true? <laughs> Stay with me on this one. This, that's an interesting question. Is that always true? Does God hate sin so much that he will break with his people for their willful sin? Well, King David, once we get into, into 2 Samuel, we meet this character David. And you've heard all about David, I'm sure. You know, David and Goliath, (laughs) right? David, the Bible says, became a man after God's own heart. Maybe the only one in all of Scripture other than Jesus that could even be remotely compared to that. But David's 100% sinful human. Jesus is not. Jesus is 100% human. He's 100% God, united together. David is just a man. And David is a sinner. And in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we have the story of David and Bathsheba. And it's a heartbreaking story because David is supposed to be at battle with his soldiers. And we find in the opening verse of Hebrews, I mean, of 2 Samuel 11 verse 1, he's not. He, he's at home. He's in the comfort of the palace while his men are out fighting and dying. This is extraordinarily an uncommon thing in the ancient world. Kings were always with their men. But for some reason, David's not. And we see that he stays in Jerusalem. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about what happens here. In verse 2, Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? There are two things of interest here. The first thing is is that David got up out of bed, he walked around the roof, and he spots this beautiful woman bathing completely naked. And his mind gets away from him. And he calls for her. He calls, he wants to know who she is. And he inquires about the woman. And and he's told that she's the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, a Hittite is not Hebrew. They are a Gentile. Very interesting that within the walls of Jerusalem, we would have Gentiles there. And David is saying, wow, hmm, interesting. And he, verse 4, he sends messengers, and he took her. And when, he came to, when she came to him, he lay with her. Now, Bathsheba over the years has gotten a bad rap because she slept with the king. But wait a second, and put yourself in this position. If, if in their world, the king of Israel, who is a dictator, what he says is the end of the discussion. If he calls for you, are you going to say no? If he makes an advance at you as a woman, are you going to say no? She was put in an absolutely impossible situation. She had no choice in the matter. Then figure that the printer now goes off to clean 
<laughs> well, anyway, she absolutely has no choice in the matter. So who is doing the sinning here, according to the scriptures? We have a clear violation of Pasa, a willful rebellion against God. But it's really all of these words, as we're going to see in just a moment, all of these words are playing a role. And eventually, why do I say that? Because David will call when she's pregnant. David will call for her husband. He will try to convince her husband to, to, to get drunk and to go sleep with his wife so that it'll look like the child belongs to, to her husband. And Uriah says, no, he won't dishonor his fellow soldiers in the field by doing this, and he won't go see his wife, he won't sleep with his wife, he won't enjoy special amenities that David's throwing on him, he won't have any of it. So David ultimately has him take a handwritten note to the general, mocks up a battle, and kills Uriah. And then he takes Bathsheba as his wife so that it appears that the child is legitimate. Throughout this process, David purposefully and intentionally breaks seven of the Ten Commandments. I mean, just to cover them briefly, I, I, I probably won't remember all seven of them off the top of my head here, but he covets someone else's wife, he commits adultery, he commits murder, he, he, he does all kinds of stuff in here. He steals, he lies, he does all kinds of stuff. And in the next chapter of, of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, we'll see that Nathan the prophet will come to David and expose to David what he's done, and there'll be a consequence for his behavior. But here's God's grace. God's grace takes the child instead of David. Because what should have happened is David should have been put to death, and he should have been cut off and removed from his people for such an egregious, not just one sin, but a whole slew of them. Unbelievable when you step back and think about it. And, and, and the mercy that God shows towards the child, we don't think of it that way, but it is very a merciful act on God because in this culture and in this time, this child this would have been not just a typical old bastard child. In the Hebrew culture, this child would not have just been an outcast. It had been something so much worse than that. A child of an illegitimate marriage, a child of an illegitimate father, an, a, a child of a king who appears to have special privileges that others don't get? Can you imagine what that would have done to all of society and, the, and what that child would have had to live with? So God shows David mercy. One pays the price, but one doesn't even never know the price was paid. I mean, this child just shows up in heaven. We don't think of it this way, but what a blessing to that child, that that child did not have to endure that kind of pain. But David, while God forgives David, which he shouldn't have according to Numbers 15, but he does, he shows David mercy and grace. David will live with the consequences of this for the rest of his life. But in the heat of this moment, let's go to Psalm 51, because this is David's response. This is his response to what has just happened. Remember, David is said to be a man after God's own heart, even though he sinned. And if you go back to 2 Samuel 11, at the very last paragraph, it says that David did evil in the sight of the Lord. And it'll say that again in, in 2 Samuel 12, 9, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and David knows the consequence of this. He saw it with King Saul. He saw that, he remo that God removed, Elohim removed the Holy Spirit from Saul's presence. And he was tormented because of his sin. And yet here we have Psalm 51. Listen to this psalm with me. And if you have a Bible, I hope you'll read it. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Pesa, rebellion, 
right? We're back at that word, a break with God, a purposeful rebellion. David knew what he was doing, and he did it anyway. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my rebellion, my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my a one, my inequity, my perversity, my depravity, my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin, hatat t, right from the word hata, erring, doing wrong, missing the mark, going astray. Against you, you only have I sinned, hata and done what is evil in your sight. There's the reference back to 2 Samuel, right? That you did evil, David. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in my inequity, in my awan, in, in perversity, in depravity, in guilt. So behold, I was brought forth in inequity in my awan, and in sin, hata, my mother conceived me, in guilt my mother's conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. So in the first five verses, we see three or four, no, three of the words for sin. We saw Pesa, that willful rebellion against God, that that act that was a break with God. We saw we saw Aon, the inequity, the guilt, and then we saw Hata, the erring, the doing wrong, the missing the mark, going astray. And one more time we're gonna see A1 coming up here. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Why? Because he's got none. He has no joy anymore. And he's going to tell us why in just a minute. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, my hata, and blot out all of my inequities, my awan. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You've probably heard that verse somewhere before. Do not cast me away from your presence, parentheses, as you did with Saul, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain with me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors, those who commit pasa. Willful rebellion against you. I will teach those people your ways, and sinners, Hata, will be converted to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Folks, we got to understand what David's saying here. Blood in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system was always the means to deal with Awan, to deal with your guilt for your unintentional sin. But in this case, it was an intentional sin. And he's saying, deliver me from blood guiltiness. Why? Because it is David's blood now which is on the line. David should be, should be stoned to death for what he did according to Torah. And he should be cut off and removed from the people forever. It is his blood guiltiness now that is on his shoulders. But he still says that, God, you are the God of my salvation. Think about that for just a moment. David is saying that you are the God of my salvation. Because he says down here below, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would give it. He can't. He can't give a sacrifice. There is no sacrifice because he defiantly sinned, as we saw in Numbers 15. The only hope, the only salvation that he can draw upon is God's mercy. 
That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. And he will go on to say, You are not pleased with burnt offering. Right? That's the next passage. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You will not turn your back on that. I am a broken man. I know I rebelled from you. I know I broke my relationship with you. I know I am the one who is responsible for this, and I am putting it on the altar of your heart. Please forgive me for what I have done. And let's think about back in verse 4 of Psalm 51 here, because he says, against you, you only, I have sinned. I have erred. I have done what was wrong. Is that completely true? Because he forced Bathsheba into that. She didn't have a choice. I don't believe that Bathsheba is guilty before God for what happened. I don't believe she has Hatta. She was obeying her king And we don't know how she felt about it. We don't know if she had remorse. We don't know if she had fear. We only have the prophet's account of David's actions. Because David did not have remorse for what he did. He was the one who was responsible for the act, not Bathsheba. He is the one who willfully rebelled against God. Fascinating when you sit back and think about it, huh? Because he will plead with God in verse Psalm 51, verse 18. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices. In burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then young bulls will be offered on your altar, on Elohim's altar. So we have a view of salvation here that David did not get what he deserved. What David should have happened, what should have happened to David is he should have been cut off and removed from the people. And in another part of Torah, he probably should have been stoned to death because he committed the most egregious of sins. And the most egregious against sins is Pasa, that willful rebellion against God or his people, because he rebelled against Bathsheba too by forcing her into that act. He is the one who broke with God. But yet he was given mercy. He was given grace. And he was allowed to keep his kingdom, though it struggled. And Solomon, who is next up, will commit such egregious pasa by falling into favor with false gods that it will ultimately break the kingdom in half. We're going to look at that next week. We're going to take a quick glance at Solomon and what Solomon learned, and how that will prepare the way as the, as the northern Israel and southern Israel divides, and how northern Israel doesn't even have one good king all do evil in the sight of the Lord, and how all these sins will play out in the breaking up of the kingdom. And what do the prophets say about that, and how do the prophets then pivot and point forward to a Messiah? who will forgive all sins, whether intentional or defiant, once and for all time. And as we move towards the New Testament, why does the New Testament place such emphasis on this salvation? And how is this salvation different? And how should it change our lives once and for all? So I hope you'll join in with me. For those of you who are thinking of attending the Bible study, that was week one. Week two ought to be interesting. I hope you'll be able to come and attend, ask questions, and engage and interact with me. And until next Tuesday. Is today Tuesday? No, until, well, I'm a day behind. This was really supposed to have been done yesterday. So forgive me, everybody. This is Wednesday and only the podcast are Tuesday and Thursday. Tomorrow on Thursday, the regular podcast will be back up and we'll be covering another topic. But I want to thank you for joining me on this part one of what is salvation and why is it so important podcast and Bible study. So until tomorrow, I look forward to chatting with you then.